Good evening. My name is Walker Mully. I am a junior economics major from Pine Grove Mills, Pennsylvania. I'd like to welcome Dr. John Marini. John Marini is a professor of political science at the University of Nevada, Reno, a former visiting distinguished fellow at Hillsdale's Allen P. Kirby Jr. Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship in Washington, D.C. Dr. Marini earned his BA at San Jose State University and his PhD in government at the Claremont Graduate School. He serves on the board of directors of the Claremont Institute, which awarded him the Henry Salvatore Prize in the American Founding in 2011. Dr. Marini served in the Reagan administration as a special assistant to Justice Clarence Thomas, who was then chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. He is the author of numerous popular and scholarly articles on politics, political theory, and film, especially the films of John Ford, and the author or editor of several books, including The Imperial Congress, Crisis in the Separation of Powers, and The Politics of Budget Control, Congress, the Presidency, and the Growth of the Administrative State. Please join me in welcoming John Marini. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Everything is, it's all right. I just, seems like some of my classes, everyone's in the back, I'm way up here. <laughs> I was asked to speak on Frank Capra and America. As many of you know, Capra was not born in America, so he was not an American by birth or blood. Consequently, he did not understand America in terms of any personal category of identity, such as race, ethnicity, gender, or sexuality, those categories that determine the good only with reference to one's own. Like Abraham Lincoln, he understood America in terms of its public or political principles those principles that establish the ground of a common good. For Capra, it was the moral principles of America that could be shared by those who could understand them and those willing to live up to them. The problem of the meaning of American citizenship is not a new one. As Abraham Lincoln noted in Chicago in 1858, after the American founders, many of the new citizens did not share the blood of the founding fathers. But Lincoln said, with the establishment of the principle of the Declaration of Independence, and I'm quoting Lincoln now and the Declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Then they feel that moral sentiment taught in that day evidences their relation to those men that it is the father of all, all moral principle in them, and that they have a right to claim it as though it were blood of the blood and flesh of the flesh of the men who wrote that declaration, and so they are. That is the electric cord in that declaration that links the hearts of patriotic and liberty-loving men together, that will link those patriotic hearts as long as the love of freedom exists in the minds of men throughout the world. That's the end of Lincoln's quote. It was the electric cord that bound Frank Capra to America. For Capra, America was not merely a country blessed with natural resources and beauty, but it was a, the embodiment of those principles of equality and liberty. His whole life, professional and personal, was animated by those ideas. Frank Capra was born in Sicily in 1897 and came to America in 1903 when he was six years old. Yet by the 1930s and 40s, Frank Capra's movies were said to embody the best in America. The films Frank Capra made for Columbia during the 1930s were hailed by critics 
and the American public alike. His films received 35 Academy Award nominations. They won eight Academy Awards, including two for Best Picture and three for Best Director. Only two other men have ever won that many Best Directing Oscars. William Wyler won three, the same as Capra, and John Ford won four. But Capra's star faded after the Second World War. By the end of the revolutionary decade of the 1960s, the actor and director John Cassavetes could say, maybe there was never an America in the 1930s. Maybe it was all Frank Capra, end quote. By that time, Capra's films were, filled, were viewed as feel-good fantasies about a country that never was. The criticism of Capra had only revealed a growing crisis in the understanding of the meaning of America. The artists and intellectuals, and perhaps some of the people themselves, no longer understood America in the way in the same way as the pre-war generation had. Did the earlier generation of Americans understand the real America? Or was that America merely a storybook tale made up by Frank Cap? And were the Americans who were moved by his art merely naive? Did America become real only after the 1960s? In order to answer that question, we must ask, what was Capra's view of America? Was it the way in which the Americans had understood themselves? How should America understand itself? That is the question. Is it in the terms of its founding principles made intelligible with reference to the eternal laws of nature and reason? Or must America be understood in terms of a process established by the contending economic and social forces of history in which success itself determines the proper outcome? Or as Lincoln posed the question, the alternatives, can they only be understood in terms of might or right? When Lincoln was confronted with this dilemma, he turned to a defense of the founders, not because it was his own, merely, but because it was right or good. In the Lyceum Address, he said, and I quote from Lincoln again, we, found our, we find ourselves under the government of a system of political institutions conducing more essentially to the ends of civil and religious liberty than any of, w of which the history of former times tells us. We, when mounting the stage of existence, found ourselves the legal inheritors of these fundamental blessings. We toiled not in the acquirement or establishment of them, they are a legacy bequeathed to us by a once hardy, brave, and pa patriotic, but now lamented and departed race of ancestors. Theirs was the task, and nobly they performed it, to possess themselves and through themselves, us, of this godly land, goodly land, and to uprear upon its hills and valleys a political edifice of liberty and equal rights. Tis ours only to transmit these, the former unprofaned by the foot of an invader, the latter undecayed by the lapse of time and untorn by usurpation to the latest generation that fate shall permit the world to know. This task of gratitude to our fathers, justice to ourselves, duty to posterity, and love for our species in general all imperatively require us faithfully to perform. How, shall, how then shall we perform it? That's all Lincoln, and that was his question. How then shall we perform it? Capra, like Lincoln, assumed the political edifice of liberty and equal rights is a fundamental good. The problem for Capra, therefore, was the same as Lincoln's. How shall we perform our duty to our fathers? For our good is in our inheritance. Our treasure is in the ideas of the founders. It is the duty of each generation to make those ideas live through the pro proper kind of education which keeps them alive. 
and it is important to celebrate the deeds of those ordinary individuals who continue to exercise the virtues necessary to maintain those ideas. Because he thought that the best of our fathers is greater than we are, Capper rejected every social or economic theory that rested upon the idea of progress or a philosophy of history. Yet it was such a view, based on the supposed rationality of the historical process itself, that established the dominant ideologies of, the 20th, cent of 20th century thought. It was assumed that those historical categories understood in terms of society and economics, reduced morality to mass movements mobilized by will to power made legitimate through economic and social struggle, made moral in the categories of class and race. As Hannah Arendt, who was a German theorist, observed right in the middle of the Second World War, she said, among ideologies, few have won enough prominence to survive the hard competitive struggle of persuasion, and only two have come out on top and essentially defeated all others. The ideology which interprets history as an economic struggle of classes, and the other that interprets history as a natural fight of races. The appeal of both to large masses was so strong that they were able to obtain state support and establish themselves as official national doctrines. But far beyond the boundaries in which race thinking and class thinking have developed into obligatory patterns of thought, free public opinion has adopted them to such an extent that not only intellectuals but great masses of people will no longer accept any presentation of past or present facts that is not in agreement with, those, with these views. That's Hannah Rent. Her analysis during the war became part of her later work called The Origins of Totalitarianism. Those views dominated 20th century thought and they continue to the present day. It is not surprising that Capra's films came to be understood in terms of those economic or social theories by American critics as well. He was often thought to be a populist, but Capra did not assume that a virtuous public opinion existed in the people, and reform required nothing more than mobilizing the people. Capra was well aware that, the, moder that mo the modern public is created by modern mass media, and it was the techniques used by mass media that spawned mass society, which posed a great danger to individual freedom. Capra insisted that his films, and I'm quoting him, embodied the rebellious cry of the individual against being trampled into an ort by massiveness, mass production, mass thought, mass education, mass politics, mass wealth, mass conformity. End of his quote. He did not assume that mass power could be used that mass power could be used on behalf of fundamental transformation of society and economy. He did not think such change would bring about a future good or could in any way right a historic wrong. The problems that American fa America faced could not be understood with reference to progressive theories of history, nor could they be solved by economic or social revolution. Political corruption or factionalism, as James Madison called it, is sewn into human nature. Capra did not advocate social or economic reform as ends in themselves. Any reform must be done on behalf of a moral education for the purpose of moral regeneration. I know that many of you will see Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Capra had his doubts about making Mr. Smith after he was president of a news conference held by FDR 1939, outlining some of the great problems that faced the United States. He wondered whether it was a good time to make a comedy drama about po political corruption. He decided to visit the Lincoln Memorial, where he saw a boy reading Lincoln's work to an elderly man. He said, and I quote from him, we must make the film if only to hear a boy read Lincoln to his grandpa. Capra left the Lincoln Memorial, and these are his words, with this gro growing conviction about our film. The more uncertain are the people of the world, 
the more they need a ringing statement of America's democratic ideals. The soul of our film would be anchored in Lincoln. Our Jefferson Smith would be a young Abe Lincoln, tailored to the rail splitter simplicity, compassion, ideals, human. The panic was over. It is never untimely to yank the rope of freedom's bell. That's the end of his quote. When you see Mr. Smith, what is surprising about it is where Capra locates corruption. It was not uncommon for FDR to attack the economic royalists or the private corruption of corporations and monopolies. It was the government and the unions that would establish the political and social institutions to combat the reactionary forces of the private realm. But Capra showed the corruption to be in the political realm. It was the politicians who had become corrupt and had usurped the institutions of government on behalf of its own purposes. Jefferson, Jefferson Smith knows nothing about the actual government in Washington. His father, who he reveres, was killed not defending a union, but an individual prospector against a mining syndicate that was likely in cahoots with the union. Capra sets his movie in a deliberately timeless place. There is no mention of depression or impending war. There is no indication of partisanship. What is meant to live in the movie are the speeches and writings of those founders that have been carved in stone but are now forgotten by those who hold the offices. Jefferson Smith's purpose is to bring them back to the Senate. If not for those in Washington, then for all those who believe in the principles of freedom. In the movie, Smith all, all, often points to the lighted Capitol Dome where the people are represented and tells, his, tells Saunders, that's what's got to be in it. And I'm quoting from the movie. I want to make that come to life for every boy in this land. Yes, and all light it up like that too. You see, boys forget what their country means by just reading the land of the free in history books. And they get to be men, they forget even more. Liberty is too precious a thing to be buried in books. Miss Saunders, uh, he's talking to Miss Saunders, men should hold it up in front of them every single day of their lives and say, I'm free to think and to speak. My ancestors couldn't, I can, and my children will. Boys will want to grow up remembering that. That's from the speech, from the movie. The only program that Smith advocated was one that was an investment in the future, a boys camp which would educate them concerning the principles of their country. Moreover, it was not to be paid for by government, but only a loan from government to be paid for by the boys themselves. Later, he says in the same movie, Mr. Smith, bring the Capitol Dome back to the ethical center where she belongs. Just get up off the ground. That's all I ask. Get up there with that lady that's up on top of this Capitol Dome, that lady that stands for liberty. Take a look at this country through, through her eyes if you really want to see something and you won't just see scenery. You'll see the whole parade of what man's carved out for himself after centuries of fighting, and fighting for something better than just jungle law, fighting so that he can stand on his own two feet, free and decent like he was created, no matter what his race, color, or creed. That's what you'd see. There's no place out there for graft or greed or lies or compromise with human liberties. And if that's what the grown-ups have done with this world that was given to them, then we'd better get these boys' camps started fast and see what the kids can do. And it's not too late, because this country is bigger than the Taylors or you or me or anything else. Great principles don't get lost once they come to light. They're right here. You just have to see them again. For Capra, like Lincoln, the principles are there. The problem is how to make the people see them again. The politicians in Washington, when this movie came out, did not like their portrayal in the movie. Many tried to keep the movie from being shown. Capra himself, however, thought it was a ringing defense of democracy. And he refused, he along with Harry Cohn, who headed Columbia Studios, refused 
the, the, the request not to release it. And the people agreed with Cap. It was a tremendous success, not only in America, but throughout the world. In 1942, just a month before the Nazi occupation of France was to begin, the Vichy government asked the French people what films they wanted to see before American and British films would be banned by the Germans. The great majority wanted to see Mr. Smith. One theater in Paris played the movie every night for 30 straight nights before the Germans' occupation. By the time America ended, entered World War II, Capra had become the most po popular and honored Hollywood director of the previous decade. Yet four days after Pearl Harbor, Capra, who was president of the Screen Directors Guild in Hollywood, left his lucrative career to join the armed forces. He was sent to Washington and was given an office right next to the Army Chief of Staff, General George C. Marshall. Marshall was very much worried that millions of men would be conscripted, many right off the farm, most of whom would have little idea of why we were fighting and what we were fighting for. Marshall made clear to Capra what he wanted, and I'm quoting Marshall's uh, uh, comments to Capra. I want to nail down with you a plan to make a series of documented, factual information films, the first in our history, that will explain to our boys in the Army why we are fighting and the principles for which we are fighting. You have an opportunity to contribute enormously to your country and the cause of freedom. Are you aware of that, sir? And Capra, of course, was, and he was nearly cowed by the assignment he, 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 he got. He had never made a documentary before. He had no idea of what to do. Later, he explained what he thought needed to be done. He would dramatize the difference between the countries at war by using their own films and documentaries. He said he merely wanted to reveal the difference between freedom and slavery or tyranny. He never thought of his documentaries as propaganda. But, of course, after the war, this series was referred to as merely a propaganda film. Capra didn't think they were propaganda because he thought they simply recognized the permanent human dilemma. The problems of war and peace reveal the distinction between right and wrong, or good and evil, or justice and injustice. The fundamental alternative in politics is between freedom and slavery, or democracy and tyranny. I think Winston Churchill or George Marsh would have agreed with Cap. They were not, would have agreed with Cap on why, on why we fight series was not propaganda. Winston Churchill said, and I'm quoting him, I have never seen or read any more powerful statement of our cause or of our rightful case against the Nazi tyranny, end quote. They were not cop propaganda, Cap Capra thought, because they made the rightful case against, uh, against tyranny. Churchill insisted that those films be shown to every British soldier, soldier and that they be shown in every theater in England so the British could see them. The end of the war, Marshall awarded Capra the Distinguished Service Medal, 1945. On the recommendation of Winston Churchill, a few years later, Capra was given the Order of the British Empire Medal in 1962. After the war, with the danger gone, it was clear that the intellectuals of the West had not understood the phenomenon of tyranny, because they had rejected the, fr the principles of freedom as understood by nature or natural right. The, liber the, the liberals had fought the Nazis or fascists. After the war, they could only see conservatives as enemies because they understood politics in terms of social, and economic, the uh, social or economic theories derived from history. Capra had remained within the horizon of the American founders and Link. He had understood, in the words of, 
political philosopher Leo Strauss, and I quote, the experience of history and, less, and the less ambiguous experience of the complexity of human affairs may blur, but they cannot extinguish the evidence of those simple experiences regarding right and wrong, which are at the bottom of the philosophic contention that there is a natural right. Historicism either ignores or else distorts those, these experiences. Strauss had noted why it was so important for historians and artists to recognize those simple experiences of right and wrong. And he gave you the reason why he thought so. He said, and I quote again, natural right must be mutable in order to be able to cope with the inventiveness of wickedness. What cannot be decided in advance by universal rules? What can be decided in the critical moment by the most competent and most conscientious statesman on the spot can be made visible as just in retrospect to all. The, object, the objective discrimination between extreme actions which were just and extreme actions which were unjust is one of the noblest duties of the historian. And I think Capra understood his, 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 his uh, art in that way as well. But the historians and the intellectuals themselves, the artists under the spell of history, animated by social science methodology, could not understand the phenomenon of tyranny. After the war, they found it difficult to praise the virtues of democracy, because those virtues were dependent upon eternal principle, derived from an understanding of natural right. Capra's last great movie was It's a Wonderful Life. Just before making it, he said to the LA Times, and I'm quoting, there are just two things that are important. One is to strengthen the individual's belief in himself, and the other, even more important right now, is to, is to combat a modern trend toward atheism. He said that movie, Mr. S uh, uh, the Wonderful Life, sums up my philosophy of filmmaking, and I quote again from him, First, to exalt the worth of the individual, to champion man, plead his causes, protest any degradation of his dignity, spirit, or divinity. Capra knew that the Hollywood class, the Hollywood class would not remain the same in terms of movie making. Uh, th those personal historical categories of class and race had become political, and self-indulgence, self-expression had replaced those simple virtues that required self-restraint. In his 1971 autobiography, he wrote, and I'm quoting again, the winds of change blew through the dream factories of make-believe, tore, tore at its crinoline tattered. The hedonists, the homosexuals, the, homo the hemophiliac bleeding hearts, the God-haters, the quick buck artists who substituted shock for talent, all cried, shake them, rattle them, God is dead, long live pleasure, nudity, yeah, wife swapping, yeah, liberate the world from prudery, emancipate our films from morality, kill for thrill, shock, shock, to hell with the good in man, dredge up his evil, shock. That's Capra's quote in his own autobiography. He had come to believe, and I quote this sentence, the last one, practically all the Hollywood filmmaking of today is stooping to cheap, salacious pornography and a crazy bastardization of a great art to compete for the patronage of deviants. Harsh words for an industry that had been fundamentally transformed. And this is only 1971. The movies have gotten <laughs> a lot worse than he thought. 1982, when Capra was in his 85th year, he was awarded the American Film Institute's Lifetime Achievement Award. In his acceptance speech, he touched on the things both personal and professional that had been most important in his life. The first was the memory of his voyage to America. He celebrated his sixth birthday in steerage on a 13-day voyage across the Atlantic. He recalled the lack of privacy, ventilation, 
and the terrible smell, he said, the most degrading place you could ever be. But he also remembered the ship's arrival in New York Harbor when his father brought him on deck and showed him the statue of the great lady holding a torch above the land they were about to enter. He recalls his illiterate peasant father's excitement at the sight of the Statue of Liberty. And this is the quote from his father. Chico, look, look at that. That's the greatest light since the Star of Bethlehem. That's the light of freedom. Remember that, freedom. Capra remembered. In his speech to the Hollywood elite that night, so many years later, he revealed the formula for his whole art of movie make. He said, and, he's, and I'm quoting from his speech, the art of Frank Capra is very, very simple. It's the love of people. Add two simple things to this love of people, the freedom of each individual and the equal importance of each individual, and you have the principle of which, upon which I based all of my films. In conclusion, it's hard to think of a better way to describe Frank Capra's view of the world and America's place in fulfilling its purpose than to turn to another great American who also made his living in the world of motion pictures. That was before he became president of the United States. Ronald Reagan was a friend and admirer of Frank Capra. They were very much alike. The inscription that Reagan wanted on his tombstone at the, his library there in, in Simi, California, could have been written by Frank Capra. Reagan's tombstone reads, I know in my heart that man is good, that what is right will always eventually triumph, and there's purpose and worth to each and every life, end quote. That's, that's, that's on Reagan's tombstone. Both Capra and Reagan looked to a benevolent and enduring providence, and the best in man's nature is the ultimate ground of political right. For both of them, like Lincoln, America was more than a geographical location where citizens shared only a common blood and religion or were merely a part of a common culture or tradition. Rather, it was a place where a new and enlightened understanding of the laws of nature and reason or nature's God had made it possible to establish those principles of equality and liberty that gave purpose and worth to each and every life. But those lives can only be purposeful and worthwhile in the service of something higher than mere life or in the indul mere indulgence of the self. Capra was aware that the moral foundations established by those principles as well as belief in God had become endangered by the transformations that occurred in American life in the aftermath of World War II. It was for that reason that the great problems of political life as he understood them could not be un could not be understood in terms of those economic and social reforms that required big government. Capra's films were about moral regeneration. He saw the necessity of moral education to preserve and revive that kind of education that would ensure the preservation or, and, and, and maintain the conditions of freedom he knew it was impossible to be indifferent to the moral conditions of freedom. For in a democracy, the people must not only participate in the rule of others, they must learn how to govern themselves. In his last and perhaps most personal tribute to his adopted country, Capper was reminded of the time when his parents got off the train at Union Station in Los Angeles after that long journey across the country way back in 1903. He said that when he, they got off the train, his mother and father got on their knees and kissed the ground. Capra told his assembled audience, one that had just honored him, some 80 years after that event, of his own feelings concerning America. His last words to his audience was, for America, just for living here, I kiss the ground. Capra did not believe that he had a right to be a citizen of, the United, of America. Not even birth in America could confer such a moral right. Rather, he was grateful for the privilege of living in America because he knew that the preservation of freedom offers not only economic opportunity, 
but also establishes a duty for all of its citizens to preserve the conditions of freedom, not only for themselves, but for their posterity. Only those willing to bear the burdens of freedom have a right to its rewards. For Capra, the real America was to be understood in terms of its virtues, which are derived from its principles. In his view, his art was dedicated to keeping those virtues alive by making those principles live again in the speeches and deeds of that most uncommon phenomenon of American history, the American common man. It was the deeds, the Smiths and the Doe's, the simple, unsophisticated, small-town, common America, American that Capra celebrated in his movies. But for Capra, like his friend John Ford, no one epitomized, epitomized this phenomenon better than Abraham Lincoln. When American intellectuals and, er and artists rejected the virtues and principles of the founders, the good of the past could no longer be me made meaningful to the present. Good of the past could no longer be made meaningful to the present. On the other hand, Capra thought the real America was embodied in its principles. He knew its past was a treasure to be cherished. But for the new intellectual Lili, the past was understood as a misfortune, as something to be overcome. Perhaps that was the view of your speaker last night. When that occurred, celebration of the heroes of the past, like Lincoln, came to be seen as naive, as something akin to a feel-good fairy tale. Capra's fate as an artist was tied up in that transformation of the meaning of America. I'm afraid its moral regeneration, which Capra had hoped to bring about, will require more than a Capra. It will require a Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marini. We have some time for questions, so please raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. Student questions are encouraged as well. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I particularly appreciated your conclusion you Thank came you. to such a different um, pass about Cap Capra from what we heard last night. I'd like to hear you account for that difference because I prefer yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the, it, it's, it's, it's not hard to account for that difference because that generation that, was, that, was, that came of age in the 1960s came to understand the new America the America that, that, that was contemptuous of, contemptuous of its past. Its past had to be overcome. And so they came to understand the goodness of America in terms of these historical categories that I've talked about. So the, the big, the big uh, pro, they, they, the, the, they looked through the lens of race or, or class or gender or any of these, these, these personal categories to begin to try to understand somebody like Capra or Ford or Lincoln or any of those people, that's, it's not possible to understand that earlier generation. They did not think in these kinds of categories. And of course there are differences in human beings, they, they all re understood that. There were problems in, 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 in politics that Lincoln had to face that were, that were such things as slavery, but all of those things were understood in terms of principle. And so if you begin your study of the past by establishing the present as the standard by which to judge the past, a past that couldn't possibly have seen itself in the way we now understand ourselves. And why do we think that our present is so superior to theirs? And yet that's the assumption, right? Now we're, we're right. Oh, they were racist, they were sexist, they were homophobic, or whatever you want to say. All of that, of course, presupposed that the moral superiority is in, is in the hands of the contemporary generation. That is all completely manufactured. 
and it's wholly problematic, and with the transformation of the regime, that too will be changed. So, yeah, I, I think the problem with historians is, of course, they understand history, and anything in the past has to be overcome by the present. And so we're living with the modern prejudices, which Capra didn't live by or understand it. I'm sure any of that generation of the 30s, it wasn't only Capra that made good movies and, and decent movies in the 30s, they all did. The 40s was important, the war was important, they all had they all saw, if you look at the great directors of, of that period that went to war, Capra was one, John Ford was one, William Wyler, uh, John Huston, uh, all of those directors that went to war when they came back after the war had a very different understanding of, of, of what, what the problem was going to be. George Stevens the, uh, was the other great director. Every one of them understood and was, was, was really sobered by what they were up against. And they learned the lessons of, 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 the, of the struggle between those principles of democracy and freedom as opposed to those principles of, of despotism and slavery. George Stevens, who was one of the great comedy directors before the war, never made a comedy after the war. John Ford, who made many great films, turned to Westerns to try to revive an understanding of the virtues because you couldn't talk about them in the present. But Hollywood was being changed. The whole culture was being changed in that period after the war. It took a period of time, of course. Capra wrote his autobiography, that quote I made, that was already just, he probably wrote that in 1970. But the, it, it was clear where the, where, where the elite taste was going where the intellectuals were going. And this is only the cultural aspect. We're seeing the political aspects of this transformation as well. When I read to you from Hannah Rett, her book came to be called The Origins of Totalitarianism. It's very difficult to prevent these categories from requiring totalitarian government in order to impose these categories on a whole population. When you have all of these necessities that to uh, uh, equalize these various kinds of uh, categories that, that, that arise from, these, the, the, from the class or race or any of these things, it's very difficult to do it within the framework of a limited government. You need unlimited power of government to impose these because these things are, these things, human beings by nature don't understand themselves or, or don't these natural tendencies that human beings have, they can be moderated, they can be ameliorated, they can, through education, be made better. But the essential character of human beings, selfishness, goodness, evil, unselfishness, these are categories of human behavior. They're very unpredictable in human beings, and, and, but you can't get rid of them. And I think these great directors understood that and made different kinds of movies after the war because they understood that America was changing. And by the end of the 60s, of course, uh, they, they began to reinterpret the past. Do you think Frank Capra might have envisioned himself as a sort of Jefferson Smith after the war to try to uphold um, the founders' virtues for America in his movies. Uh, I, I think I think when he did Jeffers, when he did Mr. Smith, he had still some hope that that the war would teach us something, would teach the democracy something. But I think by the at the at the end of the war when he made uh, It's a Wonderful Life, I don't think he. I think he, he had a very much darker vision of America. And I think if you watch that film, which people think it's a feel-good film, but that movie is a dark movie. And that movie, I think Capra portrays what he sees as the future for America. He, see, he portrays Bedford Falls, that small city that still retained the kinds of 
institutions such as the family that made it possible to have friendship and all of the things that are necessary for the virtues of self-government. He saw that as the possibility of, he showed that as a picture. And he showed Potters, Pottersville as the more likely future. And the Pottersville is, 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 is the town that, that is a kind of Dante's Inferno, morally. It, 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 and the problem with, as he saw it in the uh, It's a Wonderful Life, I think, is that uh, George Bailey character, the James Stewart character, himself did not appreciate the small town. He wanted to get out of the town too. And, and so the, uh, the, the problem there is, as Capra saw it, how to, how, to re re how to recreate and maintain the kind of community that's conducive to human happiness, that requires family, friendship, and civic virtues. And that's one of his films where the woman, the Donna Reed character, is not the sophisticated world, the, 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 the smart woman of the, of the big city as, say, Jean Arthur was in Washington or, or uh, uh, in uh, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. She was the simple housewife. And Capra's way of, say, of, of looking at this really, he's, I think it's, he's clearly very dark because the only thing that's going to save them is divine intervention. Clarence, the angel, has to show them what life would be like without George Bailey, both for his wife and for the town. And of course, uh, so it, it's hard to say that that's a very optimistic movie. And it's also the movie that probably was the end of Capra's attempt to try moral, a moral education for America in terms of its, in terms of its principles. Uh, I think he was, he was not very optimistic about America uh, in, in that period. He made a few more movies, but I think he saw what was coming with the intellectual transformation with the transformation in, in, the, in the culture and politics of, of America in those years. Uh, but his star faded in the 50s, but by the 80s, and perhaps Reagan had something to do with the fact that there was a kind of attempt to reestablish some of the conditions of limited government again, that, that Capra's, Capra's films became popular again in, in, in that period. So when you do something like that or you write a book, they don't simply die. But it's hard to make certain things resonate in times that are not conducive to those kinds of arguments. The, the real, the real are the, 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 the great uh, opinion about Capra that would exist among, in the film schools or among the intellectuals is, is McBride's. It surely isn't mine. <laughs> that, it, that's the opinion that dominates, McBride's opinion. You have to recreate the arguments that I've made. You have to recreate them by reestablishing the ground that made those ideas meaningful. When they're not, and, and so for, for a person like McBride, he just wouldn't, he couldn't understand the meaning of, of say, those simple experiences that establish the ground of, of, of natural right. He's too sophisticated. Remember one of the lines in uh, Mr. Smith when Gene Arthur says, it's a crime to be as wised up as we are. She's talking to the other reporter. She recognizes we're so smart, we've outsmarted ourselves. <laughs> And she recognized because Jefferson Smith recreated in her the experience of that kind of simple integrity that made all of that sophistication fall away. Now that's hard to, that's hard to do in real life.
Thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, it's almost, it's a relief to hear you talk about uh, our country, uh, the morality of uh, Frank Capra, the uh, meaning of his life, his early life, as well as uh, uh, his life that we all shared in film. And I frankly was saddened by McBride and his interpretation and revelations of the sins of Frank Capra. And I kept saying, no, no, that can't be. <laughs> and he says, uh, he said also that, well, uh, Frank Capra's films after he had been to war were different. Well, of course they were different. Anybody here who experienced war uh, did come back different. There was a change. It was like Jimmy Stewart. When Jimmy Stewart came back sure. after 25 missions flying over Germany, he came back a different human being. He sure. lost that wonderful innocence that Mr. Smith had. Mm -hmm. And I, I just uh, wanted to thank you so much well, for your interpretation you. and love of this <laughs> country. You. No, I'm, I'm afraid when you are a biographer, and that one of the quotes that I made, gave you from, from Professor Leo Strauss about the necessity of revealing those important, simple things, that, hath to, that has to be done by the artist and the historian to show that these events teach us something, that they teach us something. And the... the, the Capra, I think, understood that, that these, these are simple moral lessons, moral truth. The problem with, with the, the, the uh, scholars after the war and, and these, these, the, the university-trained uh, 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 historian is that they came to understand the past as a, they understood the past as something that had to be overcome. They hated the past. So in a certain way, they hated the old America. They hated that, 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 that understanding of America that animated America all the way up through the 60s. What they like about America is after 60s. That's what they like. And when you look at, when you, when you distort the past by establishing the moral superiority of the present without reference to what is right or wrong or the, or the possibility of seeing right or wrong, what you end up doing is you can make the facts conform to your preconceptions. And, and so, you know, Capra was interested in, in the public things that he did. I mean, you, every human being has flaws. There's no question about that. And Capra may have had some. Maybe he was, after 50 years after he lived his life, maybe he was wrong in a few of the details of his life. Or, or may, but I read the reviewers of, 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 uh, of McBride, because many of the ordinary reviewers of McBride's books said every time there was even a judgment call about how, whether Capra or, 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 or McBride's uh, position was right, and it was not possible to have a factual, McBride always was against Capra. Everything he did was to under undermine Cap in his book. Because, but I, what I tried to show today is that the reason he wanted to do that is not just Cap. The reason is he did not like the old America. He did not like how Americans were. Because he thinks that Capra actually did think in racial categories. Or in the, but Capra lived in a world where those differences exist they weren't paramount in the way they thought about human beings. That's just the way things were conventionally in, in those times. And, and so to, to, uh, to, to, to establish those moral categories to make judgments about character is impossible. What you do when you make those judgments is you deny character. 
It's not possible to establish character without reference to something outside. The virtues themselves have to establish that character. Even as late as Martin Luther King's 1964 speech, when he said, I have a dream that one day my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. What is, it, what is unintelligible about that statement right now? It's impossible to make judgments about human character. We only make judgments about the color of skin, the race, the gender, the orientation, all personal things that have become political and dominate how we think about these questions. For Capra, for Ford, character was the thing. Character was the thing. And character, if you have character, you try to hide your flaws, for one thing. <laughs> You're not proud of them. Uh, and uh, there was a great philosopher, a French philosopher, who once said that hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. But that's impossible now to think in that way for, for the, the intellectual. Somebody way in the back, I think. We have time for one more question. Everyone's Thank you very much. laid out. Okay. Let me get some water here. <laughs>